I have to bring in Frank Skinner at this point because uh, I tell this story. Um, I, t I tell this story about how when I first met Frank, um, I didn't realise how devout and how literal a Catholic Frank was. And uh, we went uh, on a long journey, on a long car journey, uh, and he was explaining to me something very specific, which I think I'm going to tell you uh, because it's in its mechanics, because the mechanics interest me. So Frank at the time w had left his wife. Uh, um, and he was living, I think he'd actually got divorced, and he was living with his girlfriend, uh, and uh, he was having sex with his girlfriend. Now that, in the Catholic Church, is adultery, right? And he was explaining to me that what this meant was, was that he couldn't go to confession, because to get confession, you have to confess your sin and then promise not to do it anymore, at which point you get absolution, and then you can take communion, right? And he's explaining this to me over about an hour and a half, because I don't really understand it, and at the end of it, I get out the car at Birmingham New Street Station, and I say to him, sorry, why are you bothered about all this? And he said, no, you don't understand. I think I will burn in hellfire because of this. And I literally had never heard anyone say that. You know, I don't live in 1605. I'd never heard anyone say that and, and really mean it. And I was really kind of impressed at some level. I didn't think, oh, he, thus he's an idiot. I thought that's incredibly impressive that he really, uh, really feels that. Mm. That makes him more interesting. A I'd only just met him. I mean, more interesting a person mm. than I thought. Uh, but what it does mean, in terms of what you're saying, and that's probably true, is because I come from, I guess, a Jewish background, and obviously the book is quite Talmudic at mm. some level, Jews don't have much of a conception of an afterlife. And the judgment that is going on for Jews, for Orthodox Jews, and by the way, there are 613 mitzvot, which are okay. things you're meant to be doing all the time as a Jew. As far as I can make out, it's a kind of OCD thing where you're what, you've got to kind of wrap something around your head or turn off a light or not eat this bit of pork or whatever the fuck it is. And, the, and what, the, what those people, where that comes from, the anxiety and primordial soup that comes from is anxiety about judgment in this life. Mm. And that comes, and I should have said this in the book, this is all kind of interesting, I wish I'd put this in the book, anyway, second edition, <laughs> that comes from being a persecuted minority. Mm. That comes from the sense that people are going to do bad things to you all the time, and you can't really do anything about it, but maybe if you do all these weird things all the time, they will shield you from it. Mm. Uh, but what I don't have, I think, is a sense, which you've sort of mentioned, of the idea of judgment in the life to come, and so maybe that is why I've missed that out, because I guess, yes, if you are really frightened in a genuine way of judgment in the life to come, oblivion may, may seem preferable. I don't think it really makes much difference to my sense that God is still a creation of desire and anxiety, because it it's just not, another no. type of anxiety. I suppose the question, part of the question is whether that is as primordial a part of all human experience as, as the fear of death is, and, yeah. um, or, or whether part of what you know, you've characterized as some of the differences between Judaism and Christianity might suggest that there are more sort of historically inflected circumstances in which some kinds of anxiety dominate. And I guess that's Tillich's point. Um, so it might not be as universal. You know, there might be more sort of more, more variety in the, the historical contexts and the, and the cultural and religious contexts in which people need God for different things. So, you know, there may be a there may yeah. be something that's less primordial in and other words. Maybe it's that. interesting to talk about, I guess, desire and what mm. I guess what we mean by desire, what you mean by desire, how I guess you've alluded to the idea that it's perhaps not entirely conscious. Yeah. To what degree do you choose what you desire? As Updike, yeah. I think, said, I chose to believe in God. Yes. That he, he made that consciously and C.S. Lewis would say, if your rationality gets in your way, gets in the way of your faith, then don't have it, as in it, it has to involve your rationality. But so I guess my question is, how do you know what you're desiring? Is it by seeing what your life is like and go, oh, I can back sort of reverse engineer from mm. what it seems to be I'm projecting? How can you tell what your desires are, I suppose I'm yeah. saying? Uh, and this isn't that, a come on. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question, I think, because I think in the book I am retroengineering. I am uh, looking at what I think God does uh, in terms of what, what he serves 
in the human psyche, and I'm retro-engineering and saying, okay, well, these are things that I feel, which is I am frightened of death, I am frightened of meaninglessness, uh, I sort of wish there was a more universal justice, uh, and I also, beyond that, and that's more psychoanalytical, have a sense that, yeah, there's all these anxieties and unknown things. So desire as a, if one is to be Freudian about it, desire would always be something that you might not be able to completely name and identify. Yeah. So I am assuming in writing about the God desire that some of those desires might be at the forefront of your head and some of them will be almost unnameable.